this is Castle One. Castle One. Race off speaking. speaking. Oh, speaking. Oh, oh, oh. Is on boundary up ahead, 35 seconds out. Okay, lower and faster here. Lower and faster here. Ho, ho, ho. That's a good one, Jimmy. Still gaining on the daylight there. Gaining on the daylight there. We're looking at 10.5 to 42. Five. Matching him on the boundary, yeah. Copy. Welcome back, podcast listeners. As you'll have noticed, we've had a short break. We've been a little busy, but we're back for another two-part podcast. This time, taking a look at what's just gone down in Barcelona. Just days after the 37th America's Cup was won, we sat down with four key team members from the opposing two teams to talk through that amazing summer of sailing in Barcelona. Before we get going... We've been in Barcelona working on the broadcast for America's Cup TV. More of that in a minute. But firstly, to everyone that came up and said hello out and about in the fan zone, even in the supermarket, a big thanks. It's great to meet fans of the podcast. And it turns out there were quite a few of you over in Barcelona this summer. Thanks too to everyone that's taking the time to head over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash sailing podcast. Supporting the podcast does make a big difference. If you enjoy listening to the ad-free podcast and want to support, then it's all very simple. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash sailing podcast and leave us a message while you're at it. If you've recently taken the time, then many, many thanks. If you're listening to the podcast, it's highly likely you're a sailing fan. And if you're a sailing fan, then you may well currently be suffering from withdrawal symptoms. But it had to end at some stage. I am, of course, talking about the 37th America's Cup. I've lost count of the number of hours of broadcasting we put out over the last three months. But with the preliminary regatta, the Louis Vuitton Cup, the Women's and Youth Cups and the Cup match itself... It's been a monumental summer of sailing, brought to you by a massively dedicated team. From the Cup Event Authority, the huge team of Cup volunteers, the media team, the AC teams themselves, and of course, the incredibly talented folk at America's Cup TV. It was a real privilege to be a part of all of that, and I hope you all enjoyed what turned out to be some amazing yacht racing. We did, of course, see a successful defence of the Cup. A massive congratulations to Emirates Team New Zealand. The first time in the modern era of the Cup, a team has won three times in succession. A huge achievement from Grant Dalton and his team. But there was plenty more to celebrate in Barcelona. The return of two-time winners, Swiss team Alinghi Red Bull Racing. And of course, a huge asset to the Cup, the return of a French challenger in Stefan Candler's Orient Express racing team. It was great to see them back too. The challenger of record making it through to the Cup match, only the third time that's happened. But for Sir Ben Ainsley's Ineos Britannia, they represented Great Britain in the cup match for the first time in 60 years. A remarkable statistic, a big milestone for British sailing and for Ben and the team. And of course, the Youth America's Cup, a great success, undoubtedly a glimpse into the future there. And the first ever Women's America's Cup, a long time coming but great to see the best sailors in the world out on the course fighting for the Pooch Women's America's Cup trophy. I have to say, two of my favourite moments of this summer were watching Luna Rossa Prada Pirelli win, not just the youth, but also the Women's Cups. A massive testament to a great team. A team, as we all now know, that knows how to celebrate. Right, too much to say, let's get on with it. This month, we talked to the challengers and the successful defender. In part two, we talked to Ineos Britannia's trimmer, data analyst and all-round sailing superstar, Bledon Mon, sailing in his third America's Cup, about the progression the team made all the way through to the cup match. And we talked to one of New Zealand's most celebrated sailing stars, three times cup winner, America's Cup super coach, Ray Davies. Kicking things off, though, in this edition, we talked to Emirates Team New Zealand's portside helm, sailing in his third cup campaign, Nathan Outridge. But we get things going with Ineos Britannia's portside helm, America's Cup rookie, Dylan Fletcher. 
I hope you enjoy the time I spent in Barcelona with the teams of AC37's America's Cup match. It felt as though we had a pretty poor regatta when it came to the umpire room. I don't think we maybe got a single decision that went with us. The expected performance deltas between the hulls over a 30 minute race was probably under five seconds between all of them. I think that the boats were quite close. I think in reality, downwind, there was probably nothing in it. I always knew when I wasn't driving the boat and I was on the leeward side, I had the best person in the world driving and I think he felt the same way. If it wasn't him driving on port, I think he was pretty happy to have me there. We're starting this edition with a new voice to the podcast. Olympic 49er gold medalist, America's Cup rookie, Great Britain's Dylan Fletcher. Dylan was a late announcement to the British Cup team's lineup, coming in during the campaign as a two boat test helm before stepping up to partner Ben Ainsley on the AC 75. I talked to Dylan at the Ineos base just a couple of days after the end of racing. There's a few bumps and crashes as the pack up there got underway. But before we get going, we're going to get a taste of how full on Dylan's role was. This is a segment of onboard audio leading up to a race start. The predominant voice is Dylan's, and it's all going on at 30 knots of boat speed. 13 to the pin, quite a lot to go to the pin. But that's all not. At the moment, going 11 to the pin, 24s so They're trying to hang high, 22s. 21s, no slower. Going four to the pin, 20 to the line, no slower. Dylan Fletcher, welcome to the podcast. Uh, I can imagine the last few months have been a bit of a whirlwind. A few days on now from the final cup races. How is it? How are you feeling? Yeah, certainly it's been it's been quite the journey, quite the you know campaign with Ineos, uh, Britannia, and the rest of the team. And certainly it's not quite sunk in. I don't think what we've achieved, but it's, we're very disappointed not to have claimed the cup. But I'm um, very happy, I guess, with how far we did get. It may be a, a, a bit early. We're only a few days out. But what's the feeling in the whole team? I mean, you obviously came to win the cup. But getting to the cup match, winning the Louis Vuitton, the Challenger Series, all massive achievements. What's the feeling now in the team? I think it's still like quite positive. You know, we felt like we progressed more than anyone else from Auckland or even just through the actual cup this time around. I think it was sort of odd, a bit annoying really, but the, the last race we had was the first race that we beat the Kiwis in tacking, that we finally got on top of their tacking and so I guess that sort of just outlines just how much we were progressing and just felt like we ran out of time at the end of the day. Yeah, that's always the case, isn't it? Short of, short of time. Um, let's go back a bit, Dylan. I mean, we saw in interviews, in, in the lovely features during the Cup broadcast, you know, you'd reached out to Ben, hadn't you, multiple times and you were steering the test boats. What was the moment like when Ben asked you to helm the AC75? Take us back there. Yeah, we had a um, really good week of training and, you know, Ben pulled me into the office to game, give me the good news. And it certainly was a massive sense of relief, which is, I guess, it's odd in some ways, but it's similar to when, you know, as you know, when you win the gold medal, it's almost relief because the amount of time, effort and hard work and you sort of finally got that, got that done. So, um, yeah, and then, and then reality sets in and the the weight of the expectation and pressure starts to come come on. Had it always been on the cards? Was it about you know performance and training? You know how did how did that work? It was certainly not on the cards at all. To be honest, in terms of I didn't know about it. I certainly never expected it when I joined the team, and it was only really the last you know week or two before the it got announced, or sorry that that Ben told me that it became it sort of looked like it could be a possibility. And how was that within the team? I mean, how, how did that work out? Um, I guess it was went well with the team. A lot of the, you know, the sailing team really backed me and, and Giles and I have got a great relationship and it was obviously incredibly tough for him, but he really has stepped up and made such a difference, you know, to our performance on the water. And um, I think it's testament to, you know, to how good he is and the, and the type of character he is. What's sailing with 
Ben been like? Racing with Ben, what's that like? Racing with Ben's certainly been quite an experience. Uh, he's he's obviously got so many years of experience match racing, and you know he's he's very passionate and sort of ruthless on the water and learning to how I can sail with him, how I can communicate, how I can get the best out of him, and try and help him get the best out of me has been has been an exciting challenge. I brought a lot of the work that we'd done with sort of Stu and like Joe Glanfield and our coach Roden in the um, 49er, and so I think some of the communication style helped you know evolves this campaign it's pretty wild isn't it dylan that in tv land we can hear everything that you and ben discuss how hard is that essentially your racing relationship was growing every day in the preliminary regatta the round robins i mean we heard all of that how tough is it knowing everyone can hear exactly what you're saying yeah it's certainly quite an interesting way of racing but also just the whole time you know that um although we can turn our mic off and on to the boat we know it's always on to you guys you can always listen so um it's it's something as we've sort of grown up with a bit now we did sail gp and kind of learn how to manage it there and then obviously tokyo was the first time i think that ever ever that olympic athletes have been mic'd up right so it has kind of become normal um, and certainly you have learned to, to not swear and tame the language. It's, it's different in the cup though, isn't it? I mean, the, you know, the quality of the audio also is only two boats, so you're absolutely listening to the two of you. And because there's two helms, you're having to paint the picture. I mean, how tough was it just all of that learning and all of those difficult moments played out for the world's sailing fans to hear? It was always an interesting one, the comm side, because although we knew it was open, we didn't know when it would be live and who's listening and what's being, you know, talked about. And at the end of the day, we obviously discussed a lot of our plans. So there was always the the sort of, uh, is this going to go out on TV? And if you had an issue, you didn't want to discuss that. So there was certainly, it was an interesting game we played. But at the end of the day, I think everyone got to hear the raw experience and, and exactly how we were. And, and, you know, we felt like we developed through the cup and had our good and bad days, but we're happy at the end of it, really. It was pretty brutal. I'm just thinking about you. You're, you know, it's your first cup. You're opposite Ben Ainsley. You know, you're learning quickly and at an impressive rate. But yet it is, it is just laid bare, all of that learning. Yeah, I think certainly trying to be completely flat and level the whole time was something I tried to do because you know I've been there in terms of uh, I know that the way like I worked with Stu is almost maybe how I sort of tried to work with Ben in terms of like he was sort of the the lead decision maker ultimately although I did a lot of it as well he was so trying to establish that relationship be level the whole time and um, yeah and also try and sail the boats which were a lot harder to sail than maybe everyone realized and I'm pretty convinced ours was quite a bit harder to sail than the Kiwis by the sound of it. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit more about that I mean a lot of people ask me you know who does what on the yacht during racing I mean can you talk about that at all now I mean, you're sailing dual helm of course steering on port but on starboard I mean you were very vocal what are you looking at? I mean, what are you doing when Ben is on the wheel? Just give us a glimpse into that world. So we have the tactical app, which you have, you're allowed two on the yacht, and generally the helms would have them. So that sort of gives us ley lines, how windy it is, the wind shifts. And so we would be trying to communicate, ultimately, the sort of the big picture strategist, I guess you would be when you're on that lurid side and you kind of got then the other guy is kind of the tactician effectively. So uh, there was also some other things we were doing in the background. So just sort of normal, normal sailing skills, I guess. I don't want to go into too much detail because everyone's like got their own little playbook, but there was certainly we're sailing the boat when we're on the lurid side as well as also communicating. Uh, Let's talk about the early racing. All the teams were finding their feet to some degree. I mean, if you had some technical issues in the preliminary regatta, your team lost to the Americans, the Italians, and to the Kiwis. I mean, what was what was the feeling here after that preliminary event? I guess after prelims, we were certainly kind of 
slightly disappointed, but also we we chose to maybe attack it differently to other teams. We very much chose it as a or picked it as a practice regatta and we didn't show a bunch of our plays, which we ultimately probably held back a reasonable amount. And then you kind of saw, I guess, like probably the last race with the Kiwis was really when it, you can see you get more and more of the plays come out. So trying to hold back plays, trying to hold back bits of equipment. Um, and I think that's where it's always hard to see. And also just the progression of where we were sailing the boat, we... I think compared to some of the teams, we were later to lock in some of our kits. So we were kind of on this steeper, steeper curve still at that point. You always knew there was more to come. Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> um, the Italians, Luna Rossa, Prada, Pirelli, I mean, they looked good, didn't they, in that racing? And they made it to the final. Did you think Luna Rossa looked like the most dangerous of all the challenges? Yeah, I, I think that there's no doubt that coming into the prelims, and you know, they were the well, and around Robert and all of it, they were the favourite team. They'd been going the best here in Barcelona over the summer. You know, the Americans had also been going very well, but in reality, Luna Rossa were very much the team to beat. Um, and we knew they'd be dangerous and we knew they'd maybe pick their yacht, you know, slightly different conditions to be slightly better in different conditions to us. And, and we knew they'd be dangerous and hard to beat. But I guess we... We hoped that the decisions we made, you know, would pay off. And I guess it ultimately did, but uh, certainly was worrying for a while. It's tough that, I mean, you make your design decisions years out from you know, being on the race course. It is, it, it is tough, isn't it, that it's sort of etched in so early? Yeah, 100%. Like where you, what size area your foils are going to be, how many sails you're going to make, um, what the boat sort of is takeoff versus straight line performance and all of this there's so many sort of little bits we're trading between the whole time and every team's doing that so you know we expected one set of or not one set but a broad range of conditions in Barcelona but you kind of pick the ones you think you're going to see most um so it's always interesting to see of all the teams who where everyone picks that ultimately um but I guess it it paid off against the challenges but maybe we didn't quite get it right against the Kiwis Onto the round robins. I mean, the team then started winning races. Everyone talks about making improvements, don't they? The, you know, the big gains you know, every day. I mean, what were those? What was being improved on the yacht? So I guess we at that point, you know, from the round robins, you've locked in your your best hardware at the end of the day um, because you can't. You know, we have to measure it in and it's a must, you know, it's must win at that point. And we went into the Challenger Series with the goal of being the top challenger because that obviously gives you the option into the semis. Um, so we locked everything in and we really started, we obviously had a bit of access to data at that point, um, as everyone did from the prelims. So you were starting to, you know, use that data and work out where people were doing things better than us, where we were better and trying to then Know, use that to be as a stronger team. Uh, how does that data work? I mean, you mean data on on your competitors. How does that work? So, yeah, so we, I mean, everyone had access to it, but effectively you just get their, you know, their straight line boat speeds and, you know, you can then have the course when the, the true wind angle they sail. So effectively you just really, it's, it's only the basic data, basic GPS data but um, and it's less than I think what they got last time round. But you still could see how how they would pick their turn rate in attack, or how much they would press at the end of attack. Would they land thin? Would they land wide? You know, and all of those sorts of things. It seems a long time ago now. It was actually about six weeks ago. The final races of the round robins, uh, and Ines Britannia won three in a row to force uh, a one-off decider and won that against. Luna Rossa, <clears throat> how did that feel winning the round robin? I mean, it was, felt like a massive achievement then. Yeah, I think it was a real sort of swing in the step for the team. We really were getting better and better. And then to have that opportunity to race Luna Rossa again uh, and in the race off and beat them was in a different set of conditions, I guess, really cemented the uh, the team's belief that we had the yacht that was capable of, you know, being the challenger and taking it to the Kiwis. And I think there was a strong sense between the challengers that whoever won the series could certainly go very well against the Kiwis from what we saw. 
the same as Ineos chose Alinghi Red Bull Racing. I mean, was there any doubt at all that the team would <clears throat> pick the Swiss? Was there a discussion around it? There was plenty of discussion around who we would pick. And uh, I guess, you know, it was up to, you know, in reality, you know, Ben has the, the final call there on who we wanted to pick. But we had good reasons to pick all three of the teams. Um, but yeah, we, we, pick, we picked Alinghi at the end of the day. There was that super close incident, wasn't there, against Alinghi? I mean, how nervous were you in the pre-starts, calling all the timings, but also then on the wheel, when you can see the other boat pushing hard, but also sailing with Ben, famously quite up for a fight, isn't it, in the start box. How nervous were you about those pre-starts? The, the pre-starts were, were great fun, and it was obviously an incredibly steep learning curve for me being my first time match racing. Luckily, we'd spent, you know, a long time in the sim and we'd spent a lot of time racing and uh, with Giles and Ian Williams and sort of progressing that. So I think we're lucky that that had made such a big difference. But as you said, racing with Ben is certainly he's very formidable out there, especially in the start and understanding his decision making, how I could help him was certainly a key part of that. Yeah. What did you think about that scary moment? Yeah, I kind of I knew that I knew we'd have some moments, and that was certainly certainly up there. I guess we it felt as though we had a pretty poor regatta when it came to the umpire room. I don't think we maybe got a single decision that went with us. Uh, so that we'll have to you know look at all of that. But that that Alinghi one was interesting, you know, because it was a green green that time round, and then we had one which felt like very similar with the uh, Kiwis, which we got uh, a penalty for. So we never really quite understood. What went on there? Pretty scary, I imagine, on the boat with those closing speeds. Yeah, no, it was it was certainly scary, and we were there were some discussions around how close, you know, we obviously had the boundaries, but then the closing speeds and how close they want the boat. Sometimes the umpires want the boats to get, and then how close we're maybe prepared to get the boats at times. And yeah, it's it's a shame that they haven't um, managed to sail one. <laughs> <laughs> well, not many people have. Yeah. Uh, you took on Luna Rossa in the final and it was one apiece what felt like day after day I mean actually for four days the deadlock was tough to break how much of a sense was there in the team that you had the upper hand that you could get the job done yeah it was a difficult very difficult series with Luna Rossa especially initially the the conditions you know it, they had a little bit of an upper hand of, uh, seemed at one point in the breeze um, and we obviously closed that down, which was really nice to see. Uh, they made some they made some mistakes, which cost them, you know, quite heavily. But that is part of the game and how you manage that risk at the end of the day. So, but when we finally broke the deadlock, it was, yeah, again, like a huge sense of relief. You know, you're just one away, but you just can't ever count on that at the end of the day, and you have to just keep our head down and focus on the next next race. I mean, how did that feel? October the second, you came out and won two in a row, three match points to get to the cup. How big a day was that for the team? I think it was, yeah, probably the biggest day of the team, you know, in terms of, yeah, we went on to win, but that was when it finally, you know, you knew we had this, we definitely had this with each within our grasp and um, one of, I guess, a few moving days that we had. <laughs> there was a day off, wasn't there? And then you were back at it, one more win and you'd be in the cup match. One of my favourite shots of that is Freddie Carr <laughs> standing up, arms aloft, before the finish line. But we also hear you, you know, cup rookie, Dylan, like you yeah. just can't believe it. Come on, boys. Ineos Britannia rolls the waves to the Mediterranean with a 7-4 victory. They win the Louis Vuitton Cup and will meet Emirates Team New Zealand. Come on, boys. Yes, lads, we're going to the cup. Come on, boys. What was that moment like at that time, crossing the line? How special was it? Oh, it was unbelievable to cross that finish line and, and book our place in the match. It's been, obviously, it was too long since the British boat was in that. And to, to do that alongside Ben and the rest of this team, which has been, you know, 10 years in the making, was, yeah, uh, yeah a massive achievement. And um, Freddie Carr always know, knows where the camera is, eh? <laughs> I mean, it does seem ridiculous, doesn't it, that it's been 60 years since Great Britain, you know, had made it to the to the cup. Do yeah. you feel like you were making history? 
Yeah, I guess it was a, a good sense of achievement that day. Certainly felt like it had been far too long. We've got such a maritime heritage and such an incredibly strong record, especially within Olympic sailing. And so, sort of, you know, not been made it to the cup for six years. I know we still haven't won it, but it feels like we're certainly getting a lot closer. I guess then there was a bit of a reset. I mean, did you think that you could beat the Kiwis here? Yeah, we absolutely did think we could beat the Kiwis. Um, we obviously saw them in the prelims and knew they would have made a reasonable amount of speed you know, gains. They, they changed their foils from the prelims to the, um, to the final, and that was quite interesting among itself. I guess they, they chose some interesting or some different routes to us with some of their foil packages and that sort of thing. So we kind of knew where their strengths would be, but we also knew that if the conditions played into our hands, then we would be strong as well. I mean, certainly for us in, in the TV, it was an exciting day when you both came out for the first match. We didn't really know about the Kiwis. We hadn't seen them for so long. You know, but how close were the boats in the end? From the team's analysis, you know, what was the reality? I think that the boats were quite close in terms of, I think, in reality, downwind, there was probably nothing in it. Uh, jibing, maybe we were a bit stronger at jibing generally. Um, they certainly had a bit of an upper hand on us when it came to tacking for a little while, and we worked really hard to to get on top of that. But interestingly, we were the best out of all the challenges at tacking. We were the best at jibing. Um, so, and then I think maybe straight line performance that win, we, we maybe got level on them. But again, I think it was condition dependent. They obviously that dry bulb of theirs, you know, the bit of lead that was quite high up. <laughs> Something that Prada had was strong, always going to be strong in flat water. Um, but we saw on the wavy day that we beat them twice. So I think that, you know, if we'd have seen more waves this cup, it could have been quite a different, quite a different outcome. What do you think gave them the edge? I guess the America's Cup is inherently stacked against the challengers. And um, the defender certainly was, you know, incredibly well funded. They, they, were, they started from a much higher level than everyone else if you look at last time round. Um, and then they obviously wrote the rules, I know, in association with us, but they certainly knew their loopholes. Um, and then lastly, although they didn't get that match race experience, they had the, the extra development time and we saw how much their yacht changed over the course from the prelims to the match. So certainly, you know, they, they found more speed whilst we were all locked in from an earlier date. Um. There was that one moment in the pre-start, wasn't there? You were on the port side, obviously. Uh, you must have seen the whites of their eyes on that Kiwi boat. What were you thinking as the boats came so close to colliding? Yeah, the the, the pre-start where we had the port starboard dial down with, the, with them was certainly spicy. Uh, it was... I guess we were, it was pretty scary to be honest. Like we were doing, we were certainly swinging and doing everything we could as, as hard as possible to keep clear. I was surprised that they chose to put the yachts in that much danger given, um, given the point of the regatta and all the risk and the fact that in reality at that point they kind of had, you know, they were going well and maybe thought they had a performance edge. So it was surprising that they chose to, to cause the yachts to get that close. I mean, the, the foils within a meter of each other. Um, so yeah, it was certainly surprising. And we were obviously suitably annoyed at the umpires for, uh, for the decision going against us. I mean, that had the potential, didn't it? That, that, you know, that move to be cup ending. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it certainly could have been if the foils had collided or something, it could have been damage to the yachts, worse still, someone could have been injured. So, um, yeah, it was loose. <laughs> um, you also won races too. Uh, again, the pre-start, Ben on comms, gas him, and you just said, yep. And five seconds later, the Kiwis were off the foils. I mean, you won two races that day. How good was it knowing that they could be beaten? Yeah, it was a big day that ultimately when we, we finally got two race wins on the board. Um, it felt like it had been coming and, you know, we were beating them sort of in the pre-start. So we were, felt like they were lucky to get away with 
um, some of them, certainly the, the penalty. So it felt like a big day because at that point it was, um, yeah, it was two race wins and they had four, but we were like, it was one umpire decision away from being 3-3. So it was a big day for the team. Dylan Fletcher, America's Cup match winner, America's Cup helm. Sum it up. What's the last three months been like here in Barcelona? Oh, it's been it's been close to close to a dream. Nearly ticked it off and winning the cup, but um, other than that, I couldn't have wished for any more for this team. It's been a pleasure, Dylan, watching you grow into that role. Thanks for your time. All the very best. Thanks. Dylan Fletcher, portside helm from Ineos Britannia and a real star of AC37. Well, next up, we're staying in the port helm seat, but jumping boats to the defender. Nathan Outridge was our very first guest on this podcast way back in 2019, so it's great to have him back on. He first sailed in the Cup in 2013 for Swedish challenger Artemis. He sailed for them again in 2017, and then he missed a Cup cycle and joined me in the commentary booth for AC36 before signing for Team New Zealand for this Cup. Dual helming with one-time 49er training partner Pete Burling. We're going to have a quick listen to Nathan on board, heading up the first leg of cup match number seven. Yep, they're just looking like trying to get behind us at times. Just being G0, right bottom edge of puff, we're good. We'll hit if they come, okay? Understood, yes. Pete, we're doing really well. Really well here, okay? That we'll be hitting them. Yeah, it's more just happy, inside of us. Happy pass to VMG build. It's going to be soft at the top there. You have a real good look at it, mate. Yep. Hi, Nathan. Welcome back to the podcast, mate. Thanks for joining us. Ah, thank you. It's been a, a long time, but it's good to be back and to have a yarn. It has been a while. It, it's also been a couple of days now since you lifted that mighty trophy. I mean, things have settled down a little. You know, how's the team feeling? What's the vibe after the win? I think the vibe's pretty normal for most teams when an event finishes and you don't really know what to do with yourself. Obviously, um, you know, this team's been long established and they're quite experienced at what happens when a cup's over, but to, to win it three times in a row for the team is obviously very special. And um, we took a few days off and came in here on Tuesday and Shub stood up and said, I know you're probably feeling pretty weird because every time you come in here, there's action items and things to do and he said the only real action item is to to pack up so that everyone can enjoy some downtime, which is a strange feeling for everyone who's always trying to like keep getting better at what they do. But uh, I think overall the real feeling is, um, you know, satisfaction, relief, and, um, you know, to be really proud of everything that we, we did this campaign. We're sitting in a meeting room filled with boxes, filled with screens. It's, uh, it's astonishing. I guess what it takes to win the America's Cup and how quickly the pack up's happening. Well, that's the thing. There's a lot of people involved in the campaign. Um, and, you know, in the top floor of our building, there must have been 50 or 60 computers with monitors with a lot of people focused on trying to find out how to make the boat go faster. Um, and then across the way in the shed, there was, you know, the, the physical boat that we, you know, raced every day. And, you know, when you have over 100 people working and you, Time to pack up. Pack up happens really quickly, which is is impressive, but it's also quite sad. You know, we spend a lot of time here in Barcelona sailing every day, and um, you know, you're always preparing for the next race. And when the final one comes, I think everyone does feel like they don't know what to do with themselves. You've all been playing down the the three consecutive wins thing, but that's three on the bounce for this team. Nathan, put that in perspective for us. How massive an achievement is that it's pretty incredible like i've obviously only been here for the the last campaign um but to to bounce back after san francisco as a team was was very impressive what the team did in bermuda in um you know very almost one design ac50s there with you know control systems and foils and they they really focused in on those details and did a, a fantastic job to come from the other side of the world Everyone else was in Bermuda training. Everyone else knew where they stood and New Zealand came in and did a great job there. Then changed the rule, changed the boat, changed the venue. And to be so dominant down in Auckland with, you know, such a, a fast boat was obviously, you know, in, incredibly impressive from the outside watching it all. And then for me to join the team and see how 
the culture has been developed, how it's been grown, what the expectation is of everyone within the team has been. It's been really pleasing to know that, you know, we don't always understand what every single person in the team is doing, but you trust that they are, you know, the best in the field and they're just so good at what they're doing. And this campaign has been a lot more about refinement of the same class of boat, you know, the foil optimization, the systems optimization, the sail design optimization. And, you know, what I've been really impressed by and really proud to be a part of the team is just the efficiency, how good everyone is at delivering the product when it counts, whether it's construction drawings or the actual boat being finished on time, um, the sailing team and the operations doing a good job of maximizing the potential of the boat. Um, you know, for me that that shows, you know, a good sign of a great team. And, you know, when you're inside the team you can understand why the three peat was possible. Uh, let's talk about the sailing. Uh, uh, let's talk about the EC75. I mean, you're a fast boat sailor. Tell us what they've been like to race. I think the fact that they're so manoeuvrable and we've all got to a level now where we can throw the boats around in the pre-star and we have confidence in tacking and jibing them, whether it's flat water, windy, light wind and, and waves, meant that the racing was very tactical. And, you know, for us, we, we really enjoyed that. You know, as the boats get a bit more refined and the foils get more optimised and the systems get more efficient, um, it enabled us to have, you know, proper mat tracing, which was, was great. And that's kind of what the team was expecting. Last couple, it was probably a bit more of a speed race and a bit played out in the starts and it was quite hard to make passes. But as all the racing was evolving here, you could see good boat handling, you know, good skills at tacking the boat. Being able to do an additional tack to find a wind shift was making passes possible in these races and there was lots of passes happening in uh, the round robins and the semi-finals especially and um, you know we could see that coming with all that ac40 program racing that we did do a lot of two boating in the starts a lot around the course stuff and we could see there was set plays that you know would come from old school mat tracing whereas i feel like you know my last cup in bermuda we were kind of just trying to get the boats around the course and we were always so limited on resource that we couldn't get into proper tacking jewels we couldn't do you know complex maneuvers in the pre-style around around the the marks but um you know with the refinement of these boats it definitely meant that it was a fun boat to race and um you know obviously performs incredibly fast but the efficiency of its maneuverability was what really made the racing so good how difficult are they to sail to their maximum pullers how tough is it to get the maximum out of them performance wise it's pretty tough to get them to the 100 percent. you know you could sail them around around the 90 percent relatively comfortably um and you know when i joined the team i had a really steep learning curve on how the physics of the boats work how you know the control systems work how the the human power into the control system really sort of limited what you could and couldn't do versus the 40 which was just fully battery operated but i had some really good teachers which made my life so much easier you know pete understands the boats so well and how they work and um you know obviously blair and andy an incredible job of flying the boats and making you know my life easy with a, a nice stable platform and ultimately it's a, it's a teamwork to sell this boat to its potential you know in straight line there's you know all four of us trying to make the boat go as fast as we can the same in the maneuvers and i think a lot of our focus was making sure that we could sail the boat almost with our eyes shut by the time the race began so we could look outside and race the boat and yeah it's good to have two years of training to to really be skilled up on that and you know the the challenging times were when it was gusty when it was shifty when the waves were there definitely made the boat significantly harder but um yeah after a while it did become second nature which was cool there's a lot of data to take in i mean rapid closing speeds you're used to sailing quick boats but there's no screens on a moth are there i mean how much are you close to data overload <clears throat> the boats are very numbers driven you know you don't have as much feel in this boat as you do smaller lighter boats that's for sure so you know the screens that we had were, were giving us lots of information and, uh, you know, we kind of had to own that area ourselves because you always needed to, 
you know, work out what information was important to you. So you've got your normal performance data, like how fast you're going, what angle you're pointing at. Uh, you've got your race software kind of stuff, but then you have how the entire system of the boat's working, how you're trimming the sails, how you're flying the boat, how the thing's flying in the air. So, you know, we would have had well over, you know, 60 different numericals on our screens while we're racing and you just knew where the important information is at the right time and uh yeah gone are the days where you sail a 49er and you just have a compass that tells you you're heading and you just got to remember what your heading is on port and starboard to work out the shifts there's there's so many numbers these days and we have you know so many sensors on the boat um it was yeah it was pretty hard to go and sail boats that don't have this level of tech again i'm sure yeah it was very cool uh, i'm sure it seems like an age away but let's go back to the preliminary regattas i mean the first time you got to see the challenges for real what were your initial thoughts on who looked most dangerous it was interesting i think everyone did a, a great job you know with their hull design and you know we would all obviously look at all the hulls and ask our hull designers you know like what do you think what's the difference in it and I remember receiving a, an update from one of our hull designers who said, you know, this would be the expected performance deltas between the hulls over a 30 minute race. And it was probably under five seconds between all of them. You know, you just like from an aerodynamic point of view, yet they all look so different. Um, and really the whole business end of, of these boats was what was under the water, how much drag you got, how much lift you got, how, um, you could actually control the boats while flying and obviously the sails and how the thrust came about. So, you know, ultimately we thought all the, all the boats had their strengths and weaknesses and we, we kind of spotted early on Ineos were probably more in our camp than the other teams in terms of their foils. You know, they had quite small foils, which we thought um, would be overall the fastest around the course. Um, and I think American Magic's foils and Lunar Ossus foils were a little bit bigger and probably you know put them in a, a similar place um and then you know alingi and the french we were sort of unsure how they would go we thought you know there was you know great features of the alingi boat and we knew the french boat obviously inside out was was our boat and we kind of continued the advancement of our development from there but i think the main takeaway was is that before we started racing it, and we thought it was going to be important to race the boat well to beat everyone and there would be strengths and weaknesses but ultimately it was going to be a bit of a sailor's race which was fun for us. Let's talk about the comms on board I mean, you were without doubt probably the quietest of all the boats. How did you feel about the fact that we could all hear your chat on board? It was great for the viewer obviously but how was it for the team and especially a team that likes to keep its cards close to its chest? It's always an interesting one, the onboard comms. You know, we all know that good comms on the boat mean good decisions. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time working on our comms to be short, direct, and always as calm as possible. Uh, and I think it's been fantastic for everyone watching the broadcast to be able to hear all of that, um, you know, in the live broadcast. But then they started putting all the stern cams up as well. And you could just listen to the entire race of each boat. I remember that from uh, Auckland sitting with you doing the commentary just the whole time saying let's just listen because that's where the real story is and every night I'd go home there and listen to the onboards of both boats just to understand where everyone was at and you know where the stressful moments are around the course to try and ultimately try and work out where not to speak and, <laughs> and let them tell the story but as a, a competitor it's um tough giving away that IP and ultimately you got to give it away if you want to win the races and but um, you know, obviously we we only had a few races prior to the cup and then all the races in the cup. So we kind of felt like there's no point trying to hold stuff back, just put your best foot forward and if they hear what you're talking about, you know the next day they'll be better because they've heard what you've said. But you had to keep evolving your your comms playbook to make sure that, you know, if if you used a, a play that you often had to rename it the following day, which was quite fun to do as well. We, we loved you in the live broadcast. You, you, were, you were the commentator. I, I mean, you, talked, you did talk a lot on board. You, you led the charge, I think, on, on painting the picture. You know, how much did you see that was your role to, to raise your game in that? Yeah, it was, it was definitely one of the things that was um, 
highlighted and Ray sort of said to me early on is like we we need to make sure we have some good comms and you know we all know everyone has you know incredible skills in the team but we need to get everyone to gel together so I tried to take on a little bit of saying not I didn't want to come and make the decisions I wanted to create the conversation and the decision would be the outcome of the conversation so you know when we're here debriefing and discussing you know Ray Josh and Sam were, were really pushing us to have the right conversations to make the right decisions in you know all the playbook sort of stuff and on the water um, particularly when I was on the leeward side I was just trying to let Pete on the other side and Andy know what I could see down here and pose the question you know if they do this what should we do which would just reset everyone's mind to like the playbook would say in this scenario if they do that you know our best shot would be to do this so it takes a lot of bandwidth to sail the boat when you're driving to really get maximum performance and I kind of felt when I wasn't driving that's how I could add the most value and when I was driving I was you know, receiving similar information, you know, from, from Blair who was in front of me and Pete on the other side of the boat. So, yeah, it takes a while to develop that kind of communication and it takes a lot of trust to, you know, um, trust what the person on the other boat says that you can't see. So, uh, yeah, we, I think we did a really good job and should be proud of what, the, you know, our style of sailing that we had here. Um, let's talk about your starboard helm. I mean, how's it been sailing with Pete? It's been really fun. You know, Pete and I go way back. Um, it must be about 15 years ago we met and we had like a full quad sailing 49ers together um, with Pete and Blair and, and Goobs and myself. And we did lots of training in Australia and around the whole world. And whenever we were in Oz, Pete would come and stay at our house. And, you know, he was kind of part of our family there for a few years. And then as that um, campaign finished, I got involved with Artemis. He got involved with Team New Zealand. And we didn't have the time to do the 49 training together anymore. And we just went our separate ways and became like proper rivals as opposed to friendly rivals. And um, that friendship kind of was kind of ended, but it was ultimately just put on pause. And um, I remember like joining the team and wondering how it was going to go. How are we going to gel together after such a long time apart? And, you know, I think it, it took a while for us to kind of get, an understanding of how it was going to work, but um, it's it's been pretty enjoyable, you know, sailing with um, some old friends and trying to put your heads together to try and win, as opposed to trying to put your heads together to try and beat each other. You know, it was quite a a different setup. You know, we'd do the 49s, we'd do the moths, we'd always help each other, but ultimately you're holding something back to beat them. Whereas, yeah, this campaign we haven't haven't held anything back you know Pete's done a great job of helping me understand the boats and you know driving style and how to get the most out of the boat and then when I finally got to a level that was was even then we've just been always trying to like improve the performance of the boat because ultimately that's what wins the racing and um yeah we've had you know many discussions and debates about starting strategy and you know course geometry and how you defend other boats. And for me, it's just been so much fun to be with some really smart sailors. Um, and, and that definitely includes Blair and Andy and Josh and Sam, like the amount of discussion we've had over the last two years about how we wanted to race has been great. And of course, race facilitated it so well, as well as the coach. So it's been, um, it's been really enjoyable. We, we had a good sailing team meeting, or not meeting, dinner last night. And we're all just sharing our our words and our thoughts from the campaign and you know it's it's been a special group of people that have i think we've all brought the breast out of each other which has been fun talk to me about how vital that relationship is with the dual helm it's really important to have the trust of the other helmsmen on the boat and um you know i think the reason why it works so well for us this campaign is Pete and I, we go way back. You know, we, we did all the 49 training together and you just kind of race that. Even if you became fierce rivals for almost a decade after that time you were so close together training, you, you still know who that person is. And, you know, there was so much mutual respect between the two of us. You know, we've competed for gold medals against each other at two Olympics. Um, you know, we got one gold, they got one gold and, you know, got the silver each time. So... 
I always knew when I wasn't driving the boat and I was on the leeward side, I had the best person in the world driving. And I think he felt the same way. If it wasn't him driving on port, he, I think he was pretty happy to have me there. And the more time we spent together, the, the stronger that got. Um, so, you know, you can see other, other teams, there was potentially rivalry fighting for the starboard seat. There was no arguments in our team about that. You know, I knew that Pete's the skipper of the program. You know, he's won two America's Cups with the team. He was always going to be driving on that side. And my job was to assist as best I could on that. And ultimately, once the start gun goes, you still do 50% of the race each. And I think as nice as it is to be a, a helmsman on these boats, I think the rest of the crew are, are just as important. And I think, you know, Pete and I learn a lot about what it's like to sell these boats as the passenger on the leeward side and walking around and looking at components of the boat. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, was, um, it was a pleasure to do it and I hope we get to do it again. What are you doing on the yacht? I mean, steering, obviously. But then when Pete is on the wheel, Give us all some insight about your role then. What are you up to? Well, as I said, we've got lots of data to look at on our screen. So on like training days, you're analysing the data live while you're going and looking at the performance of the boat, the sail set up. You're looking over the side at how the foil's behaving in the water and you're talking and giving feedback about what you can see. Uh, ultimately, there's really only four of us on these boats that are like looking around and feeling how the boat works in terms of the flight and the trim and the stability and you've got a huge team in chase boats and ashore listening to every word that you say and looking at video feeds so it's the best time when you're not driving the boat to try and give feedback and to talk and to think about what's happening and I remember like doing the Bermuda campaign on the AC50 and you're switched on the entire time you are driving and then you are running and then you are driving and your heart rate's elevated and you're constantly in this one position of driving and thinking about the racing and the performance. But when you hand the wheel over and you tack and you're on the leeward side, you're like, okay, all right. I wonder how I could have done that segment better. I wonder how I could have done that tack entry better. And then you sit and you watch the other guy and you look at all of his numbers and you're like, ah, oh, okay, I see he's doing that with the sail trim. And I see he's moving the traveler and you're like, oh, I think maybe we need a little bit less twist than we've got. And you give that feedback from on the boat. And on days where it's not super rough, you get out of your cockpit and you walk around and you pull the leech line on a little bit on the jib and you like take some photos up the sail and you look at some of the fairings and take photos and send them to the designers while you're sailing so that they can see what you can see. So often the, the driver gets the boring job. The driver is just locked in. It's when you're not sailing the boat you actually really give some good feedback, which is that's a lot of fun. During the Louis Vuitton Cup, there's a big period, isn't there, when you're not racing. What did you do? I mean, while the challengers go through the semi-finals and then the final, give us a glimpse into that world. Well, we obviously watched the racing really closely. <clears throat> we were very interested to see how the racing styles were going to develop between all the teams and trying to work out what the strengths and weaknesses were of all four boats initially and then as two got eliminated we you know shuffled our focus on to just two um so we were always doing that kind of analysis and then internally we were basically just making our boat go faster you know we we learned a lot about racing against the other boats and changed a lot of things on our boat to make it go faster to have it a little bit better across a wider wind range you know we had new sails coming in that you know hadn't even been built when we were racing up here to start with then we had you know optimization happening on our foils on our rudders we were developing our you know power system the flight control system like everything was basically getting developed flat out during the period while they're racing and we're obviously on the water sailing as well and we were using the race course to get out there and sail in the same conditions and try and get a feel for how our performance was going trying to understand the weather conditions so when you watch the racing you hopefully can learn more about your competition as well. So I think a lot of people thought, oh, five or six weeks, they're going to be a bit rusty. They're going to be, you know, not as sharp as they were. And it was our mission to be sharper. And I think we, we had a much faster boat, which made our life a bit easier. Um, but we also were pretty pretty switched on to how we wanted to race. And I think we, we put our best foot forward on that first day, which was really pleasing. 
So you're you were allowed on the racetrack before in that period before racing. Yep. Um, but I mean, who are you racing? How does you know? How does that work when you say you're trying to, you know, trying to be sharp? How do you manufacture that? Well, we the protocol allowed us to use the course equal amount of time during that whole period, but obviously we couldn't use it at the times we wanted to because you know it was reserved for racing. So we got a chance to use it in the hour and a half before and we'd try to jump on in between the two races and then we'd normally leave it was quite hard because there's so many spectators here watching the racing which is amazing but unless you're in the protected area of the race course it was quite dangerous sailing out there and you ended up having to sail so far away that you weren't learning the venue and we've been here you know all all summer and all last summer trying to learn the venue but there'll be someone out on a wing, you know, in the middle of the course and someone would fall off a windsurfer and then there's a paddleboard and we're like, it's just dangerous being so close to the beach. So a lot of our training ended up being so far away. So we were trying to use the time we had on the course to just get a feel for the wind patterns. You know, how fast is this wind shifting today? Is it, you know, two minute oscillations and that'll get you boundary to boundary or is it like a slow persistent shift that you have to keep stepping back up to the right to protect that? And by being on that race course, we learnt that kind of stuff. And then when we watched the racing that happened, you know, 20 minutes later, we kind of got a feel for how they were playing the tactics as well. Whereas if we had been, you know, up the coast somewhere, we just wouldn't have got that information. <clears throat> and then how do we like race ourselves? Well, we, we still have the same race software information. So we do a lot of practice starts on our own, trying to do the set plays on our own trying to like you know practice you know doing maneuvers up a boundary we were literally just getting really creative with um racing on our own which is quite hard um and we often get calls from the chase boat saying you know you got a penalty now like you need to clear it or you know you've been tacked on like you need to double tack back to the boundary just trying to make a life hard and uh yeah, it doesn't, there's no substitute for racing another real boat that you can see with your eyes, but uh, it was quite cool to just get creative during that period. Um, it was Ineos Britannia in the final. I mean, what did you think about the British team? Well, I think they did, did an incredible job. Um, not, not just this campaign, obviously this campaign, but just since Ben put together the, the British team, you know, in Bermuda and Auckland and here, everything's been a progression everything's been built upon something that was started before and um, definitely could see that it was a much more mature team here than we'd seen before. Uh, you know, and like all good teams, their development curve through this campaign was exactly what was required to get to the match and to, to give us a real challenge, which they definitely did. You know, they, they got really creative with their their boat they had a good test boat program despite what a lot of people said i think they learn a lot through that program and uh you know i think they did a great job putting together a boat that still had plenty of potential to keep sailing it and uh you know right from the first round of racing we did here they got better at sailing the boat the boat went faster and their race craft just kept getting better as well and you know we we followed everyone closely but obviously um we followed them in luna rossa the most because they were the the last two to race it's an exciting day isn't it race one you get to see the two yachts for the first time and your first america's cup match nathan how big a sense of occasion did you feel how, how nervous were you it was a huge day and um particularly so with the send-off we got from our base here you know it's something i hadn't experienced before we had of course, all the friends and family in here, we had the Natu Fatua with the full haka, like basically cultural, spiritual send off going to war. And I remember standing on the boat just going, like, this is unbelievable what is happening today. You know, you're, you know that the America's Cup is a big event. You know the first day of it's always going to be huge. And then you just get that kind of send off. It's like, wow, we've. We've really got to go and win this thing because there's a lot of people here who are depending on us. Um, and then as we docked out, you just looked around the whole harbour and there was just people everywhere, Kiwi flags everywhere, super yachts, little boats. Like It was something like I hadn't experienced before. 
And in the days building up to it, you know, I was like, I, I knew it was going to be a big moment. You're looking at the long range forecast, trying to work out what you're trying to prep for that day. You come in that morning and clouds tells us, oh, yeah, it's not really good chance you're going to get much racing in today. It'll be probably no wind till two and might just get over the wind limit around 2.30 and you'll be straight into it. And I'm like, oh, great. That's ideal preparation for the first race. Just go out, pull your sails up and wait, which is what happened. And Clouds has been exceptional with his his forecasting just to give us an insight to what we're getting ourselves into. Um, and, yeah, to to have, you know, two really good races on that first day definitely settled the nerves, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be lying saying that, you know, if we, if we hadn't have defended the cup, um, I would have felt slightly responsible having been the, the new one into the team, <laughs> having seen them do so well previously. So that first day was pretty settling for me. Um, and, and, the, and the thing that probably helped me the most was you look around and no one looked stressed in our program. Everyone knew we were ready. And uh, that's just how you want to feel. You want to feel like you're ready to go and... We went and executed two really nice races that day and came in and everyone, you know, was relaxed and chilled and so that's how it should be and and then we marched on. Um, as you say, you won the first four races. Why do you think you were able to do that straight out of the blocks? I think it came down to a lot of our hard work and, and preparation on our starting and, you know, our boat performance. I think, you know, we we were ready for the fight, I think speaking to a lot of people when I joined the team, they know they didn't put their best foot forward in Auckland, um, very focused on performance, didn't get enough race practice in, hence why we got two AC40s in our program, hence why the 40 was probably created so we could get the racing that we needed because you were never going to get good racing in the 75s because that was effectively the development boat to the end. So we were up for the challenge of the racing, we're excited to to do the best we could on that and um, saw it as a great opportunity to really just get out of the block strong. We knew that um, it was going to be hard and, you know, all we wanted to do was just get some runs on the board that first weekend and, you know, we, we really enjoyed mixing it up in the pre-start. Um, it was, you know, you remember the dial down in, in race three. Yeah, it was, um, we were pretty, pretty happy to be able to, like, see an opportunity, take it, the penalty goes our way, convert that into another race win. And, you know, after four races, we were, we were in a strong position, but we knew that every race, like things had to, things worked out very well for us in every race to win those races as it should when you win. But um, we knew it wasn't going to be that far away that, you know, we would potentially get a loss. And we also knew that we just had to stay sharp. Those pre-starts were so vital to win, weren't they? They were, you know, the... The performance of the boats are, are so similar um, and if you can just get your nose slightly ahead or just be on the correct side by a little bit and just have that small advantage at the first intersection you end up with so much more control you end up with um, just that little bit of a buffer that you need and we were able to do that quite nicely in the first three races and in the fourth race Ineos had the upper hand, but we managed to wiggle ourselves out of a bit of a situation and get a shift at the top mark and, and take it from there. But, you know, we, we knew that the races we were winning, we were earning. You know, we're up against a good team who we were sailing really well and, you know, we were, we were earning each win as it went, which was obviously very satisfying. We all know how it all unfolded. 7-2, your first America's Cup win. How does that feel, Nathan? It's honestly still sinking in. You know, I've been involved in the Cup now for, for 10 years. Um, every event I've been to has had, you know, very different experiences. You know, new kid at the block in San Francisco with a, a really difficult campaign with Artemis in a very strong position in Bermuda and just fell short against Team New Zealand in the LV final there. And then I completely missed the cycle. You know, and when you miss a cycle and you're, watching it happen and talking about it happening as a commentator, you, you're sitting there wondering, is the chance ever going to come back? Um, so when it came back, I was like a, a massive opportunity to, to try and finish something personal for me that I, I started a long time ago. And, um, you know, as I was, you know, going through the years and the months with this campaign, you could just see that I was a very small cog in a huge organisation 
And um, if I just did my job well, everyone else would do their job well and, and we'd be in great shape. And I just put my head down and worked out where I needed to help and, and did the best I could in that area and just watched every other person doing the exact same thing. So it's, it's, it's extremely satisfying and, um, you know, very special and uh, hopefully uh, get a chance to do it again. I can remember you on the podcast, series one, episode one, the very first, Nathan, and you told the story. You signed for Artemis back in 2013, but hadn't asked them whether the boat had foils or not and were rather surprised when you turned up and they didn't. I mean, things have changed since then, haven't they? I mean, how much have you loved being in this America's Cup environment? I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into when it came to the Cup back then you know I was an Olympic sailor I love sailing fast boats so I sailed the moth a lot and the sailing I did was small individual little teams uh, and I was you know this little kid from Australia getting an opportunity to be involved in the cup and I'd obviously followed the cup and watched the cup but didn't understand the culture of the cup and the America's Cup is like, it's infectious. You speak to my wife, Emma, she, I think, said this was her seventh or eighth cup. You know, her dad was involved with Team New Zealand back in, what was it, 88 with the big boat against the, the catamaran, and he did pretty much all the cups up until Bermuda. He was, he's been at all of them, and, and Emma's been there as a kid. And then she's been there also um, working, you know, for Louis Vuitton and working in the media center. And, you know, we met in San Francisco. So for me now, the America's Cup is like family. You know, it's whether it's this team or whether it was my Artemis team, which I still feel like it was a family then, or it's just the entire event, the teams, the people who come and do the broadcast, the people who come and put the racing on. We're just one traveling circus that goes from one city to the next. And it's not like we're here in a flash and we're gone. We are, you know, here for years and then we have no idea where we'll go next. But I'm sure that, you know, in three or four years time, we will see the same people, see the same faces and everyone will be here putting their heart and soul into to this event, which is very special. It's, it's far more than a sailing competition. And, uh, you know, you go back a decade ago, I had, absolutely no idea what it was about and what I was about to get into and yeah, here I am now it's, uh, it's the fourth campaign I've been to uh first cup fourth cup I've been to and uh you know I'm, I'm pretty proud to say that you know we brought our two boys into this America's Cup they've had an absolute blast and uh it's uh it's just lifelong memory so it's really special Nice Nitridge America's Cup winner. Many, many thanks. Oh, thank you. Nathan Outridge ending our Port Helm edition of the AC37 podcast. A great insight from two previous 49er Olympic gold medalists, both sailing in their first America's Cup matches and two sailors very much at the top of their game. To Nathan and to Dylan, a very big thank you. You heard some extracts from the ACTV broadcast throughout this pod. So a big thanks to the team for all the hard work. And because this is a podcast, I have to say a big thank you from me to the ACTV sound department. The audio we get off the boats during racing really is fantastic. The team do an amazing job. It's so insightful. So a big thanks on behalf of all our listeners to Team Sound. If you've enjoyed the podcast and you'd like to support the pod, please do head over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash sailing podcast. We work hard to bring you this ad free listen. It takes a lot of time. So it's lovely to have your support. Many, many thanks for that. And of course, another massive thanks to to the ever talented Tim at Vertigo Films. Tim's editing America's Cup interviews in his sleep these days. He's been immersed in the cup for months and months. So I was, of course, delighted to put together another final podcast. Tim, on behalf of all our listeners, a massive thank you. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. Have fun on the water and sail safe, everyone.
This is Castle One. Castle One. Race officer speaking. Oh, Slingard is on boundary up ahead. 35 seconds out. Give it lower and faster here. Lower and faster here. Ho, ho, ho. That's a good one, Jimmy. Still gaining on the line there. Still gaining on the line We're looking at 10-5. 10-5. Matching him on the boundary. Yeah, copy. This is Castle One standing by. Out.